It is a privilege today to be a part of a book launch for yet another one of Dr. Crave's significant um, works, Between One Faith and Another. Uh, this institution owes Dr. Kraft a, a great debt. Um, our late chairman of the board, Lee Hanley, was always a great man of faith, but he told me not long before he passed away last November that uh, one of Peter Kraft's books, Three Philosophies of Life, was a major turning point in his own spiritual pilgrimage. I've seen this myself in very many ways. For all of those years that I was teaching Intro to Philosophy, I always assign Christianity for modern pagans as a textbook, which is a uh, condensation and an explanation of the work of Pascal's Pensees. And I vividly remember one of my former students, uh, Benjamin, who had drifted uh, uh, away from the Christian faith and I did not make any progress with him for three years. He went to hear Peter Kraft give a lecture. He corresponded with Peter Kraft, and in about two weeks, he was uh, back on board and is now a faithful communicant Catholic living outside of Paris. So uh, we owe him a great debt of being such a faithful, steady presence here at the King's College as a professor of philosophy. Uh, he boards the train from Boston and comes down, and uh, as uh, the other Dr. Thornbury said recently on Twitter, you know that it's the fall semester because you round the corner and Peter Kraft is at the chessboard challenging our student body to uh, match his wits on the chessboard. It is an honor, uh, Dr. Kraft, to have you here today, and would you please join me in welcoming Dr. Peter Kraft after he speaks we will be having a time of questions and answers, so get them ready. Dr. Crave, please come and welcome Dr. Crave. Thank you very much. I don't like good introductions because you can't live up to them. My favorite introduction is the shortest one. Here's Johnny. <laughs> My favorite sermon is also the shortest one ever preached, as far as I know, it consisted of four words. God preached it to the medieval mystic St. Catherine. He said, I will summarize all of divine revelation in four words. There's only two things you need to know. Number one, I'm God. Number two, you're not. <laughs> well, for some reason or other, uh, the King's College has chosen to use the nautical metaphor of uh, a book launching, as if the book were a ship. And. Uh, Somebody came to me a moment ago and said, I'm a, a fan of yours, so I guess you want the ship to hit the fan. <laughs> this book is about the relation between the different religions of the world. And therefore, it's terribly important, not simply because we're living in a global village, and because world unity versus world diversions or d digressions or, or isolations or even violence is a, is a serious problem, uh, but much more importantly, because religion is the most important thing in human life. The vast majority of all human beings in the history of the world, in all times, places, and cultures, have thought that religion was the single most important dimension or aspect or ingredient in their lives which is why Freud, in his book Civilization and His Discontents, logically and consistently says that most human beings are insane. Because if there is no God, and everybody who believes in any kind of God uh, says that's the most important thing in life, well, on this most important of all issues, uh, they are treating an invisible friend as if he's real. like. Jimmy Stewart did in the old movie Harvey. Harvey is a 13-foot-high invisible rabbit whom only Jimmy Stewart can see and only Jimmy believes in. I mean, he's the most important person in Jimmy's life. He's a nice guy, but he's nuts. On the other hand, if atheism is true, then all religious people are nuts. Excuse me, if, if atheism is not true, then all atheists are nuts. They're like kids who go home for Christmas vacation and their parents are at the door and they don't believe in their parents' existence so they don't look at them, they don't talk to them, they don't thank them for the Christmas presents, they don't thank them for the food, they act as if they're alone. That's insanity. 
So either 5% of humans or 95% of humans are insane. That's a pretty important question. There are a lot of religions, though, not just one. They all have something in common, but it's a very hard thing to define. There's something superhuman that is the most important thing in life and the ultimate answer to every important question. But what that something is and how you know it, uh, very serious disagreements. So the relation between the religions of the world is the second most important relation in human life. The most important relation is your relationship with God, the vertical relationship. But the second most important question has to be the relationship between those different relationships. So this is not a, a, a topic out in left field. This is right on the pitcher's mound. Do all the religions of the world say the same thing? Are they all roads up the same mountain? Or do they contradict each other? So that if any one of them is true, the others are not. Or is it impossible to say? Is the most we can say is that they're different? Uh, a horse and a donkey can mate and produce a, mu a mule, but the mule is infertile. Uh, a lion and a tiger can mate and produce a liger, but the liger is infertile. But different species of dogs can mate and be fertile, and um, other creatures can't mate at all. For instance, uh, uh, an inchworm and uh, a horse. So the issue of whether the religions of the world contradict each other, complement each other, or are just different, and let's be just non-judgmental, is the fundamental issue in comparative religions. Ronald Knox once joked that a study of comparative religions is the best way to make someone comparatively religious. Uh, that was very funny, but I don't think it's true. Uh, you appreciate what's your own by contrast with what is not your own, which is why atheists and naturalists can't really appreciate nature. There's no supernature. There's nothing to contrast it with. So I never, I never heard an atheist like the term Mother Nature because if there's no Father God, there's no Mother Nature. There's just nature. Well, I teach a course in world religions at BC. I think I'm going to teach it next year here at the King's College, which goes through the eight major religions of the world, starting with primitive religions uh, and then emerging into the four main Eastern religions, Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, and Confucianism, and the three main Western religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And one of the issues that always comes up from the beginning and repeatedly in the course is how do these religions relate to each other? And I keep telling my students, you can't answer that question until you study each religion separately. But the question is so tempting that it gets asked all the time. Uh, so what I did is I put my course into this book in a very simplified and abbreviated form. Uh, from the beginning, the question is, how do the religions of the world relate to each other? And as the characters uh, emerge from the classroom uh, in that order, having studied each of the world's religions, they're, they're at, at uh, Harvard, uh, they get a little more light on the question of the relation between them. The three characters are an exclusivist, an inclusivist, and a pluralist. Uh, I made the exclusivist out to be an atheist, not because all exclusivists are atheists or because all atheists are exclusivists, although most are, but because atheists tend to be hard-headed, logical thinkers. And my character there, Thomas Keptic, which is a pun, he's a skeptic, uh, is uh, that kind of atheist. And it certainly seems, logically, that the religions of the world simply contradict each other. Are there many gods or one? Has this one God revealed himself? Did he create a world? Is he a person? Did he author the Ten Commandments? Did he choose the, the Jews as his chosen people? And finally, uh, does he have a son who became incarnate in Christ and rose from the dead to save us? Those are questions, fundamental questions, that the different religions of the world answer very differently. And the answers certainly seem to be contradictory to each other. So exclusivism is the default position, so to speak. Yet inclusivism, which says that all the religions of the world deep down are the same, or at least compatible, 
uh, has always been around. It's always been a minority position. Uh, I think our time is the first time where it's, if not the majority position, at least the second most popular. Pluralism is probably the most popular. The image that there are the different religions of the world are many different roads up the same mountain, and that they all meet at the top, and that everything that rises must converge. That's a very popular image. Uh, the image that probably explains the exclusivist claim the best is the opposite image, not one of height but of depth. Imagine a diver in Hawaii uh, starting on the beach where he sees that the Hawaiian islands are at least five different islands, and then going down into the depths uh, and where he sees that these five islands are really all united underneath the ocean in a single uh, mountain mass. And only because you're not deep enough do you fail to perceive that unity. Uh, according to the inclusivist, the mystics agree, the theologians don't, because reason is ordinary consciousness above the water, and mystical experience is enlightened consciousness below the water. And once you get below the water, you see that all the religions are one. Well, that's an interesting claim, and it's not self-evidently wrong. Uh, it accounts for the apparent contradictions between the world's religions by saying that if you had the right eyes, you would overcome them. The problem is you have to have a mystical experience to be sure, and most of us don't. But it's at least a challenging claim. The pluralist, the third possible position, uh, is somebody who can't believe either in exclusivism or inclusivism, but who understands that one of the two must be true, but thinks we can't know which. So all we can know is that the religions of the world appear to be different, Maybe they really are, as the exclusivist says. Maybe they really aren't, as the inclusivist says. But they're certainly different. Can they marry? Maybe so, maybe not. We don't know. Maybe we'll know in the future. The fact that there are three positions uh, fits my style because I like trialogues. I often explain to my class that uh, the ideal course is a course where you hear three voices. You hear the voice of the professor, you hear the voice of the students, and you hear the voice of the great minds that you're studying. I assume that it's better to study great minds than little minds, and better to read great books than crummy little books, uh, although that's unfashionable in most places. Uh, you can have a monologue. I have a friend who's very brilliant but very eccentric, and he says, my philosophy of teaching is that I hold solitary converse with the divinity and the students are privileged over here. <laughs> he's not really that arrogant, he's just funny. But that's one philosophy of teaching, the lecture system. Another philosophy of teaching is just to have a, a bull session with the students, as if this were a large tavern without alcohol. Uh, what, what do you think? Let's, let's share our, our feelings. Well, there's a place for that, but I don't think that's the main thing a classroom should do. Uh, the most important uh, of the three speakers in any classroom ought to be the, the mind that you're studying. And in this case, it's the divine mind, if there's anything divine about religion. So I like trialogue because it's the closest human analogy to the Trinity, where you've got three voices which talk to each other, and they're not the same, they're different. In fact, if we understood God perfectly, we'd know that he is the three most individualized and personalized characters in all reality. So, uh, in this little book of mine, we have a trialogue, uh, which makes things very interesting, uh, because it's dramatic, and it's not just one voice. And we have the question of the three positions, exclusivism, inclusivism, or pluralism, argued about from the beginning to the end. And along the way, we have a survey of the fundamental teachings of each of the world's religions. So it's a nice everything in one. How do I conclude? Well, at the beginning, I confess that I am a believing Christian, and therefore, at least theologically, an exclusivist, 
which doesn't mean a salvation exclusivist, only Christians get into heaven. There might be anonymous Christians, and I don't think God gives you a theology exam at the gate of heaven, and if you get a 69, you go to hell, and if you get a 70, you go to heaven. <laughs> On the other hand, I'm very suspicious of the wishy-washy people who say, well, all that matters is that you're sincere. Well, Hitler was sincere. The devil is terribly sincere. Uh, there's a problem with that. And I'm a little suspicious of pluralism, too, because it sounds like the easy way out. So I think there's some truth in all three views. Uh, morally, uh, every religion really has three levels, let's say. It has the intellectual and the moral and the, let's call it the liturgical or the, uh, the spiritual or the worshipful. Uh, theologically, it certainly seems that exclusivism is true. Morally, inclusivism is largely true because the different religions of the world, though they have very important differences in theology, have only minor differences in morality. Every one of them says to the ego, get off the throne, which is not obvious and not easy. So that's very impressive. So I think if you, if you look at the moral dimension of religion as the essential one, you tend to inclusivism. On the other hand, each religion, or almost each religion, has already a great deal of pluralism in its forms of worship and expression, and in its, uh, its art, its, its liturgy, its prayer life, its meditation techniques. So their pluralism reigns. So if that's the most important aspect of religion to you, you tend towards pluralism. As a professor and uh, a philosopher, uh, I like to emphasize the idea dimension, the theology dimension, as the first one and the one that explains the other two. So I am more of an exclusivist than anything else, but I think there's a, a good case to be made for both inclusivism and pluralism. So if that makes me wishy-washy, I'm sorry, but I have to conclude where Socrates concludes. I really don't know all the answers. Uh, and that's where I end. Uh, people who start this book and are convinced that the question is an important question and are convinced that there are objective truths and answers to good questions, uh, expect that at the end I'll finally pull the cat out of the bag and say, here is the knock him down, drag him out, best answer and my proof. And you might be disappointed by the fact that I don't do that. I come back to Socrates. For Socrates, lesson one is the the first lesson that anybody needs to learn in order to learn anything. Lesson one is that we don't know, that we know at least a lot less than we do know, and therefore we investigate, we, we ask questions. Skeptics don't ask questions. They don't think they'll ever get answers. Dogmatists, in the popular sense, don't ask questions. They think they've got all the answers. So only if you're halfway between those two do you ask questions and can you be a good philosopher. So uh, I've summarized the book, uh, and the book summarizes in a very simple and maybe even simplistic way these religions, and then I argue, argues about the much more difficult question of how they relate. I don't claim to have solved the problem. I just claim to have cast a little bit of light on it, and I hope that if you read the book, you'll be a little more enlightened at the end than at the beginning, enough so to say it was worth the price. So that's my modest conclusion, and now I've, uh, I've performed, I've done my thing, my dull thing, my monologue. Now we can get to dialogue, which is much more interesting. Questions? Um, do you think that God could give a, um, or that there could be a revelatory process with people that are outside the explicitly Christian tradition, people who aren't saints, aren't church fathers, weren't the writers of the Bible. Do you think there could have been something along those lines in a philosopher like Plato, for example? Almost all the church fathers say so. And they say that the preparation for the gospel takes place in pagan lands, and that's not merely the Roman Empire with its roads and its Roman peace and its language, but also with the Greek philosophers who found a lot of truth. Uh, in fact, in the New Testament, you find at least two concepts taken straight from Greek philosophy. One, the concept of logos uh, in John's Gospel. Christ is identified with the logos. Well, any Platonist or Stoic reading that would say, oh, 
You mean the thing that I thought was abstract truth is a person. What an interesting claim, connection. And the other is dunamis, or power. Uh, the kingdom of God consists in dunamis, not just words. So there's a lot of con uh, connections. In fact, in Acts 16, when St. Paul preaches in uh, Athens at Mars Hill, he, uh, he goes up to uh, the, uh, what's on top of Mars Hill, the Agora? The Acropolis, yeah, uh, which is where Socrates philosophized. And the road up there, called the Road of the Gods, uh, is littered with temples, which in Paul's time, uh, not temples, but altars, uh, of both the uh, Athenian gods and foreign gods for visitors. Uh, and when Paul starts his uh, talk, he says, I notice that you people are very religious because you have many gods. It's a left-handed compliment. It's an insult, really, veiled as a, as a compliment. But then he says, the, uh, the altar that intrigued me was the one that didn't have a statue on top of it. And the inscription was, to the unknown god. Well, a little background here. Socrates was a stone cutter. That's how he made his money. Didn't make much. Didn't any, get anything for philosophizing. But uh, stone cutters used to cut inscriptions because you didn't need great talent to cut inscriptions. You needed great talent to, to sculpt human forms. So Socrates may have sculpted that very inscription. And the god he worshipped was the unknown god. He claimed to know nothing about him. He was a pious agnostic. And the next thing Paul says is a blockbuster. The God you are already worshiping, I will now reveal to you. In the Greek language, uh, there's a distinction which doesn't exist in English. Uh, a verb can be in the aorist tense, which is uh, a one-time action in the present, or it can be in the present progressive tense, which is a habitual action. And he uses the present progressive tense. The God, some of you at least, the disciples of Socrates, are habitually worshiping and seeking. Good for you. You've got the right question. Here's the answer. What a connection. So, yes. <laughs> In fact, that shouldn't surprise us because Jesus himself said, seek and you shall find. I don't think he was talking about winning a million dollars. I think he was talking about God. All who seek him will find him, if not in this life, then in the next. And those who don't seek him won't find him. In other words, we all get what we want. So Mick Jagger is wrong. You can't always get what you want. Other questions? He's the richest philosopher in the world, by the way. He got a philosophy degree. Afternoon, Dr. Kreeft. Um, does the book provide uh, any sort of framework uh, for a, a common dialogue between the, the various world religions uh, that can work toward uh, a, a common view uh, of human flourishing? Uh, and if so, uh, what might that look like? Not what you're probably looking for. Not a psychological or sociological new framework that will encourage ecumenical debate. No, just the laws of logic and honest, sincere seeking, the kind of thing Socrates already did. So it's not at all technical. It's very commonsensical. Next question, please. If you, if you don't have any questions, I'm going to tell my Aristotle joke on you. Diogenes Laertius, in his Lives of the Great Philosophers, tells this story about Aristotle. Uh, Aristotle, like Plato, wrote Socratic dialogues, although they're all lost, and he loved them. And after each lecture, he wanted his, his students to engage in a Socratic dialogue with himself as the professor. He wanted to play like Socrates. After one lecture, there were no questions. This, this deeply disappointed him. So he said, if you were listening, my lecture was about levels of intelligence in the cosmos. There are three. There is subhuman intelligence among the animals, which is considerable. There is human intelligence, which is rational. And there is divine intelligence, which is superior. Now, you can distinguish human intelligence from the other two levels by the very same empirical fact. We observe that people ask questions. Animals don't because they know too little. Gods don't because they know too much. So if you have no questions, 
shall I congratulate you upon having risen to the status of the gods? <laughs> or shall I insult you upon having sunk to the level of the beasts? <laughs> and the last sentence of a little anecdote is, and after that, there were some questions. <laughs> so any humans among you? Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, I, I promised to read the book, but the first I saw that the first chapter is about the definition of religion and the difficulty of coming up with a definition of religion that applies to all the things we'd usually call yep. religion. Yep. I will read the book, but if you could give a, a pithy summary of, of, is it possible to find a definition of religion, that would be interesting, especially Confucianism is the one that always seems to be. The problem is that if you define religion as something like belief in and worship of a god, it excludes Confucianism, Taoism, Buddhism, and even some forms of Hinduism, which everybody admits are religions. If you broaden the definition to say religion means belief in some sort of absolute, that's much too broad. Atheists usually have an absolute. Marxists certainly do. So I think religion is equivocal. What religion means to a Jew or a Christian or a Muslim is a very different kind of thing than what religion means to a Hindu, a Buddhist, a Taoist, or a Confucian. Western religions all believe in something public and universal, some divine revelation that everybody has access to. Eastern religions don't. They're mystical. They're esoteric. You can't understand their scriptures unless you have their religious experience. In the West, it's the opposite. You judge religious experience by the public scriptures. Yet, we do meaningfully use the word religion for both. So maybe I shouldn't say it's totally equivocal. Maybe I should say it's just semi-equivocal or analogical. But to sort out what we have in common and what differentiates us is notoriously difficult. Certainly much more difficult than most people think. The more I study the different world religions, the more I'm convinced that the simple answer of the inclusivists, they're all saying the same thing in different words, and the simple answer of the exclusivists, they all contradict each other, are both much too simple but I don't have a clear concept to put in place. Sorry. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Craig. Uh, you mentioned some, um, in a couple of different parts of your talks about um, animals that could mate and reproduce and some that couldn't, and later you, you mentioned something about could the groups be married. Could you expand on what you meant by that? Okay, uh, that's whether exclusivism is true or not. Exclusivism means you can't believe in two of the religions of the world completely and sincerely at the same time. In other words, they can't marry in your own life, in your own mind. Inclusivism means they can. So I use the, the image of biological marriage to mean uh, an image of the marriage of two faiths. Now, to a certain extent, obviously they can. For example, uh, the meditation techniques uh, in Zen Buddhism might be useful as an adjunct to Christian prayer as long as it's within the context of, of Christianity. Or they might not. I'm not sure. Just as Aristotelian logic, which was developed for a purely secular purpose, is very useful uh, and marriageable to the Christian faith. Thus, we have theology and, and, and apologetics. So it may be that certain ingredients in non-Christian religions are very useful for Christians. But all of them? And how can you believe that God both did and didn't create the world? How can you believe, both as Hindus do, that you are God or a manifestation of God or a part of God automatically, and also believe, as Christians do, that we're in, born in original sin and need to be born again? That seems a clear contradiction. Hello, Dr. Craig. Uh, so my question is, you talked about how we can understand and appreciate our own religion more when we study other religions. Mm -hmm. And I would think that you would also agree that it sharpens our understanding of our own religion in addition to um, increasing our appreciation of it. Yep. So how much time do you think we need to really put into studying all the other religions and ideas um, as opposed to studying our own when we think that it is true? Well, I'd say approximately 2.3% of our time. 
that's an impossible question to answer. First of all, because there's certainly a relativity there, different strokes for different folks. For someone who teaches a course in comparative religions, he'd better do his homework. Uh, for somebody who's only moderately interested in it and there's no faith crisis in his life, he's not thinking of converting to, to Hinduism, and he doesn't have any friends who are, uh, it's more a matter of curiosity. So I, I, I have no clear answer to that question. It is an intrinsically important question. Here are the most important truth claims in the world. How do they relate to each other? So simple honesty demands at least some attention to that question. But I can't tell you how much. Ask the Holy Spirit. He's better than I am. <laughs> Dr. Kraft, would you clarify for me a little bit more about the inclusivist perspective? Because earlier in the talk, you talked about it relies upon a mystical experience mm. that isn't necessarily going to be common to everybody. Mm -hmm. And then later on, you said that if you're most attuned to the moral dimension of religion, then you'd be more inclined towards the inclusivist. So I'm, I'm wondering how those two ideas come together. Well, just because the moralities of the different religions largely agree, and just because you may think that that's the central aspect of religion, that doesn't mean that that gives you a mystical experience. So if you have those two qualities, you probably believe in exclusivism, but you can't be sure of it because you haven't seen it for yourself. You respect the conclusions of the mystics because they agree with your thinking. But they're certain, at least they claim to be certain. They've seen the unity of all religions, you haven't. So for them, it's a matter of experience, for you, it's just a matter of faith. For most Buddhists, for instance, or most Hindus, it's a matter of faith. Uh, when I was in Japan studying Zen Buddhism on a Danforth, I uh, went around asking the Zen masters uh, all sorts of smart alecky Western questions. And one of them I asked is repeatedly is, do you have any criticism of Buddhism as it's practiced? And they all said the same thing. Almost no Buddhists. In other words, mystical experience is very rare. Uh, in a sense, something like that is present even in Christianity, which has a lot of mystics. And if mystics get a foretaste of heaven and in some sense see God face to face, you can believe that that experience was authentic. You don't have to, but you can. But you haven't had it, so you don't know in the way that they know. Last question. Hello, good doctor. Hi. My question is, uh, when writing this book, were there any uh, arguments or points of analysis that you had better interest in in writing this book? Or was it essentially, uh, since it was taken from a previous course, more of a copying pasting into the book? Uh, what were some general arguments that you took a particular interest in more in writing this? What, what wait a minute, stay here, I got a question for you. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> a question about your question. Uh, obviously, the main question of the book is how do the religions of the world relate to each other? But you want something more specific. Um, or, what, what were you thinking of? What, what, ideally, uh, what were you hoping, what, what question were you hoping that my book might cast a little bit of light on for you? Or I, I guess my question was more personal. Was there anything that you drew even more particular interest in and in delving into in writing this book in the process? Yeah, okay. yeah. My experience of interviewing people like Houston Smith, who was an inclusivist, but a very brilliant and sincere one, my experience in meeting Buddhists, both in Japan and here, uh, left me with two very different impressions. One, I was very impressed with the spirituality, the sincerity, and the piety of most of them. Number two, I was not impressed with their arguments. Uh, it was something similar to meeting Mormons. Mormons are almost always very good, sincere, uh, pious people, but their theology, I think, is very wacky. <laughs> so I'm puzzled by the, let's say, imbalance of the head and the heart. I don't think their head is on straight, but I think their heart is definitely on straight. But maybe I shouldn't be surprised at that. <laughs>